spot and stalk deer hunting, long miles, harsh conditions. You're watching Deer and Deer Hunting TV. This is where it all begins. This is Deer and Deer Hunting TV. I like to refer to it as the three P's of spot and stock mule deer hunting. Patience, persistence, and drive. Wait a minute, that's not a P. Two P's and a D. Okay, patience, that's the spot element of spot and stock hunting. You're gonna spend a lot of time behind your optics, picking apart the terrain, looking for deer, looking for pieces of deer, maybe a little bit of sunshine off an antler, the blink of an eye, the twitch of a tail. It's all about optics. Persistence, it's that mindset that there's always a deer around the next bend in the terrain. You need to have that persistence to keep you going all day long. Spot and stock hunting is a very physical game and it's a very mental game. And then there's the drive. You need the drive to keep going day after day, hour after hour, lots of times under adverse conditions. So spotting is 90% of your deer hunt, whether you're in the white tail thick woods or out in some of this bigger open country. Now right here I'm looking at mule deer and white tails from this same vantage point. That makes it a great vantage point because I can see creek bottom terrain, green fields where they're feeding, and rough country where the mule deer might be coming out of. So regardless of where you're geographically located, you want to get elevation. This elevation here, eh, it's just a little hill, but it gives me what I need to see all the country. If you're in Ohio, say, maybe your elevation is gonna be an old barn or up in your tree stand. If you're out uh, in Arizona hunting coos deer, well, maybe your elevation there is a high mountain, 7,000 feet up. All of the different aspects of your hunt, though, you definitely need to find elevation when you're doing spotting. Like I said, that's 90% of the battle. Finding your deer, then going after them. You know, sometimes it just makes sense to climb out of the tree stand or crawl out of the ground blind. Uh, maybe it's the weather conditions. Uh, maybe it's just that there isn't a lot of deer movement that day. Why not get out and be a little more proactive? Why not get out and spot and stock? It doesn't matter if you're hunting in the east or hunting in the west. Sometimes it just makes a lot of sense to get out and burn some boot leather. Well, it was a first good afternoon of hunting. We're seeing a lot of deer. We've seen a great mixture of mule deer and whitetails. Now, in this part of Wyoming, you can't expect to shoot a Boone and Crockett whitetail. It could happen, but we're seeing some nice deer. The big thing is the rut is starting. It's pre-rut, it's cold, it's gonna be in the teens tonight. I'm freezing right now, I can hardly talk. But we're seeing what we wanna see. A lot of deer near my home. Now I'm gonna go crawl into my own bed, and then we're gonna get up in the morning and get after it again. Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Technology Plus. Apply it, try it, and go hunt. Hornady, accurate, deadly, dependable. Get armed and deadly with Easton FMJ arrows and buy 10 point crossbow technologies. There is no substitute. This segment of Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by Redneck Blinds. 
I think the most important thing for anyone who's going to do a spot and stock mule deer hunt, especially if this is the first time you're ever going out west to hunt, you need to be confident in your shooting abilities. You need to be confident that you can make the shot in the field, but it starts at the range. You need to know your gun intimately, but not just shooting off the bench. You need to practice those positions that you're going to encounter in the field. Shooting sticks are going to be your best friend, but they're not always going to be available. Let me tell you, things can happen really quickly on a spot and stock hunt. You need to be able to shoot from prone, sitting, kneeling, standing, and the only way you can get good at that is by practicing. And you need to be able to make longer shots, 100, 200, 300, 400 yards. You need to practice so that you feel confident in making those shots. If you can't make a 300 yard shot off the bench, you have no business taking that shot out in the field. If you're going on a spot and stock hunt, out west or anywhere, you don't want to get it wrong. The first thing you want to have in your corner, in your favor, is not be seen. You don't want to be spotted, you're spotting the other game. So, stay low. Keep on the inside curves, down low as you come over. Don't be silhouetted. The second thing you don't want to get wrong is to be fast. You're spotting and stalking and that takes some time. So don't just walk into a basin like this here, do one of these and think you're done and through. Sit down, take your time. Not only glass everything in a quad fashion, up and down, side to side, all levels, but stay put. Those animals, white tails and mule deer, if you're hunting the right area, may pop out of a draw after 15, 20, 30 minutes, even an hour. An hour is not too long to walk into a big valley and sit and look before you move on. Number three, this is the third point you definitely don't want to get wrong, and that is you want to bring the right optic. Now I like a 10 power binocular and that's what I'm using here, but spend a little money and bring along a spotting scope. Now the reason you want a spotting scope is to save a little bit of a the vibram on the bottom of your boots and some extra calories. You don't want to wear yourself out. So I've got deer right now at approximately a half mile out. I can't tell with my binocular how good a bucks might be in there. Maybe a good frame buck. But with a spotting scope, I can look at that deer from here and if it's a good buck, I can go after it. 80, 90% of the time, it's probably not going to be one I want to go after. I've saved some Vibram on my boots and myself a few extra breaths. This is how tame wildlife is in Wyoming. The prairie dogs, they, they want to be petted like regular dogs. Right? He doesn't want to go in. Oh, there he is. Now, not only do you find a lot of hunting pressure in these general hunt areas, you see it in Wisconsin, you see it in Wyoming, you see it all across the nation, but you also see a lot of pressure on public lands. And I like to hunt a combination of public and private. I, I get some access on private land. Not very much, though. I'm just like you. Whenever you go knock on a door, yeah, the majority of the property, it's been leased to an outfitter. Relatives are coming to hunt it over Thanksgiving or whenever, and you just can't get on. So you gotta pick and choose. One day hunt the public, one day hunt the private, and somewhere in between, hopefully, you'll get a buck. That was my strategy. I started out on some public land, big public land that basically was a mule deer haven. And those mule deer, well, they'd sought a haven somewhere else. I went to a high spot. That's the whole basic starting strategy of spot and stalk hunting. Get up high, use your binocular, and try to spot something on the move as it's going to a sanctuary, bedding area, call it whatever you like, somewhere where it calls home. 
I did see a lot of activity that morning. There were deer here, deer there, some small bucks in with the doe groups. But right now, that time, I just didn't see a shooter buck. And this area can hold some good bucks. They show up unexpectedly. Like I said, it was the very, very beginning of the pre-rut. A big buck could roll in, walk into a doe group, sniff around, and then walk out. But those big bucks, they weren't commandeering or commanding any herds yet or any harems of does. After that first day hunt, there was a little bit of light left. So I took a trip down the road, just kind of looking, glassing some of the private fields, adjoining some public and some more private that I had opportunities to hunt. Right there beside the road was the buck that was perfect for me. He was pushing some does around, basically right in the ditch, but on private ground. Nice five by frame with matching kickers on each side. He was an easily identifiable buck and not too far from either or properties where I could hunt. Would he go there overnight? Probably not. He had plenty of does right there to make him happy. So I headed back. I'm still thinking I'm going back into that public land the next morning, but it was nagging at me all night long. Was I making a mistake by giving up that good hay field where whitetails and mule deer roam or should I head back to the public land at first light? This segment of Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by Matthews. Do you ever wake up and think you made the wrong decision? I was kind of leaning toward going to the public land again. But then, all those deer in that hay field that I watched that night, even after seeing that better buck close to the public, you know, on the drive home, I just could not give up on that private land. A buck had to come in there overnight. But basically it was the same bucks I had seen the night before. Nothing else had slipped in. I was driving back and met one of my friends along the way. We pulled over and started talking. And what he told me next, the story made up my mind for the day of where I was going to hunt. There are a lot of benefits of hunting from home and one of the best is getting intel from your friends. For instance, the reason I'm right here at this location to hunt this afternoon and the wind's blowing is the fact that my neighbor, I stopped by, just talked to him to say hi, they had gotten a buck this morning and they'd seen a bigger buck in the location they were hunting. So he shared with me where they had seen the buck. My afternoon plan is to go hike in. It's about a mile or so in hike to where they uh, saw the buck disappear spend the afternoon just glassing, snooping around and see if we can't find that big buck and make a good afternoon hunt. If nothing else, I'm learning some new country and uh, got to talk to a great neighbor friend. Once I got close to the area where he said he had last seen that buck, I got down, started creeping up and peeking over into the biggest draw in front of me. My eyes were wide open. There were does bedded all over and a few were getting up to feed. Suddenly, I was trapped there. The only problem was I was laying prone. Now that's not a bad problem for shooting. I always shoot prone whenever I can, but it's a bad problem for, mm, yeah, you're back, you gotta lay there. And I ended up laying there more than three hours waiting for something to happen. I woke up from a little cat nap and just looked and whoa, there's a buck, big neck, brawny body and I picked up my binocular and started looking him over and immediately recognized him. It was the buck I'd seen the night before down on the road, several miles away with those other does. Apparently the whole doe group had moved uphill into these higher breaks and were right in front of me with this big buck in tow now.
tired after that. I've been hiking six, seven miles a day at least to get after these deer. And this is exactly what we wanted. A nice buck with character from Wyoming. It's general season. Do it yourself solo. And this is what we came up with. That's what hunting's all about. Hard, sweating, a lot of sweat equity in this deer. And then coming up with a situation like this where we sat on these deer for several hours just to get him to come out. Now a lot of guys would have pushed that hunt. And I'm not saying you're wrong if you do, but in my opinion, if you know he's in the area, and we had a pretty good idea he was, it's best to wait him out. I've waited up to five, six hours on some deer to get shots. This one was about three hours. And uh, if you'll agree with me, I think that Kaiser plan worked. The Kaiser crawl got me up into position. A little bit of patience got me the shot. And there you have it. General season Wyoming, a great mule deer buck with some great eating ahead. Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by Analogix. Protect your herd with the power of science. Thompson Center, America's master gunmakers. Sever Broadheads, straight through it. Hunter Safety System, stay connected. And by Cuddyback, more deer, fewer blanks. One of the biggest frustrations I used to have with bow hunting is what to do with my broadheads during the off season or even between hunts if I'm using different types of broadheads. That's changed with this new Easton Stay Sharp broadhead case. This is really cool. The way it's designed is it will hold up to six broadheads, three on one side, three on the other side, but the engineering of this case is really cool. It holds the broadhead. You can shove the broadheads in there really snug and secure and it doesn't open the blades while doing so with any type of mechanical broadhead. Let me show you how this is done. I have two different types of expandable broadheads here. I'm just gonna take them off my arrows really carefully, as not to cut myself. There's one. Take this one off. There's two. Okay, so now with this broadhead case, I can take my broadheads grab it by the end of the ferrule and tuck it right in here. This is not gonna open up. I can put it in sideways, I can put it in vertical. It's just gonna catch the sides of the ferrule. This is really unique the way this thing is designed. Get them in there, push them in, really snug and secure, not going anywhere. Do the next one. I'll put this one in sideways. Check that out. These little rubber bumpers the only thing they're catching is the side of the ferrule. They're not catching the blade, so the blades are not gonna get dull. Pushes in there nice and snugly. Does not move, I wanna pull it out, watch this. Didn't touch any part of the blade, only the sides of the ferrule. It's, it's ingenious the way they designed this thing. Same with this one. Nice secure cap, keeps them all intact. I'm ready to store them for the next time I go bull hunting. Check them out today at EastonHunting.com. Still on some private ground. And there's a big cornfield over here. Big cornfield over here, they're obviously picked right now. And uh, that white oak right there, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a little light colored area up there about 25 feet. And I've got, that's where I hang from my sling. And basically, so this is a tight pinch point. When this, these corn fields are up, they don't transition through here that much. But once the corn's down, any deer coming from that direction, and there's a big swamp that direction across the road, that want to get over to this area over here where there's some apple trees and some other stuff, 
they kind of have to transition through this because this is good security cover. Uh, and in the fall, it's a little bit taller and more dense than it is showing right now. But that tree right there is perfect because I can basically shoot to both sides of it. And there's also a uh, primary scrape right up on the corner of this field where it makes a 90 degree turn. And it also doesn't hurt that there's a tractor lane going from that field over to this field right through here. So when even when the corn is up, that's a pretty decent spot because deer will transition down the edge of this corn sent checking for does going in and out of it. And they'll also transition from that corn to this corn down through that tractor lane. And that's within a 15 yard shot of that tree. So that's just a great pinch point tree. It's a great transition tree. It's a primary scrape tree. Uh, that tree offers a lot of different, a lot of different uh, unique features.